Our next learning target is called the principles of design. You're going to be able to understand how you can use the principles of design to improve your photographs. So you're using them as techniques to make your pictures look more interesting. So if you can keep these in mind as you're composing your pictures, framing things up, deciding what to photograph, you're going to be uh, creating unique pictures and you won't get burned out as easily uh, making the same things over and over again if you can purposely try to use different techniques that you'll learn here. So what are the principles of design? They are ways that the elements of art, which you learned in the previous learning target, are organized within an artwork to make it more interesting. For example, when you look at this picture, the way that the lines are organized, the amount of space that the ceiling versus the ground in this uh, subway tunnel takes up are creating a good sense of balance and also a movement with the way that our eyes move down into the tunnel. There's a lot of different principles of design that can happen in the same picture, so it's not just one um, that will necessarily stand out to you. Just like in our last learning target, we learned about how our eyes can see things differently, and um, the way that you see things can be right as long as you can really explain it, and it, uh, and it is logical in your explanation. Here's another example photograph. Um, some of you may think balance may be more interesting in this image because of how there's a equal spacing of one side versus the other. You could almost fold that picture in half on itself and it'd be the same on both sides. Some of you might think it's interesting that the feet that are closer to the camera are larger than the feet that are further away. And that's something called scale, where you're comparing the size difference of different things in a picture as they move further away. Again, it can be right as long as you explain it and it makes sense. The first one that we're going to talk about is something called rhythm. Rhythm is kind of like how you can have rhythm in music. You've got a repetition of something, like a melody. Except in a photograph, we might be using an element of art to create that repetition. So we might see a line repeating over and over again, or color, or even space and shape and texture. We have those things repeat over and over again, and it creates a rhythm because of the spacing used. So there's three types of rhythm that you can use. The first one is called regular. In this one, we're probably looking at a, uh, a scene straight on, not from the side, but straight on, and it's gonna create equal spacing of those elements of art. So in this picture example, we have equal spacing of the columns and the doors and the lights. But if we were to take this picture from an angle, so right on the side, we'd be creating a different type of rhythm. The next one, and here's a picture example, is something called ra random rhythm. Instead of having equal spacing or uh, progressively different spacing, there's going to be no uniformity to the way that we see that thing repeating. So in this image, there's a repetition of people, but there isn't really a mathematical way to determine how that spacing happens. Um, they repeat, they're all over the place, they take up the space in the image, but um, there isn't any rhyme or reason to the way that the rhythm goes on. So the next one is called progressive. Progressive is uh, noticing the change in distance of that thing repeating. So it may be growing or it may be shrinking um, with the direction that we view of that spacing. But again, we're photographing something and we've got a same thing repeating, like these lines on the zebra, but they progressively change in their distance to one another because of the angle of the camera. Here's some examples. You might consider what type of rhythm is being used in these, uh, from regular rhythm to progressive to even random. Our next concept is balance. Balance has to do with visual stability and it relates to the way that we see the image and it creates a sense of evenness for us when we're looking at that image. You can have three ways to see it. There's formal, which is having a line of symmetry and you could fold the image in on itself for uh, either vertically or horizontally um, and that would be you know, equally spaced. Informal is having the same visual weight. For example, the same 
visual space is being used up by the girl as the wheel, but there isn't a line of symmetry that could be used to make that uh, look like you could fold it in half on itself. Or you could have something called radial balance, and radial balance is you have a point in the image and things are the same on either sides of that point. So if you kind of go from one side to the other, it's going to look the same. Um, it's possible to have radial and formal in the same image. But if you look at something like a flower, uh, we'd be having radial balance going on um, as we kind of view over the, the middle point. Here's some examples of images showing balance. Uh, we've got formal balance here, informal balance here, comparing the space the Eiffel Tower is taking up versus the sky, uh, radial balance here, and we have um, informal balance going on here. The amount of space the people are taking up versus not taking up in the image. Scale has to deal with uh, the size difference of different objects within a picture. It's used to create depth and perspective in a work. Um, and it can kind of fool our eyes into believing things that aren't, you know, in reality working. Uh, for example, this car is definitely much larger than the person. Um, but in this case, we've made it the person looks even smaller than they would in real life, uh, like a little miniature version of a person. Uh, and this is because of the uh, distance and the focal length that we're using in the image. So scale, again, is the size difference between different objects in the photograph. Here's some examples. You know, things that are closer to the camera will be larger versus further away. Again, same here. Um, this person looks like they're the same size as the doorway, but we know in reality that's not the case. It's all about our perspective. Scale can help our eyes move. Um, or you can create scale through uh, a different way, and that's, you know, editing an image. So here they've edited a book to be much smaller in a person's hands than you'd normally have for that. Proportion is a different concept than scale. With proportion, we're noticing how lifelike something is versus not lifelike. So you can make things in proportion or out of proportion based on how lifelike or unlifelike things are. So when we're um, thinking about proportion, we're comparing one part of something with itself and seeing the size relationship between those things. For example, we might notice somebody's hand compared to their face to see how that makes sense. Like in this image, they're in proportion. Or maybe over in this image, we compare the size of the hand to the face and we notice how it's way off. This is out of proportion. A lot of it has to do with the lenses that we're using. Whether they be wide angle, which distorts things, or telephoto, which compresses them. Here's some examples. Again, a lot to do with the focal length that's being used or the focusing distance. Uh, macro mode tends to warp things with the wide angle lens. Uh, here's a wide angle lens, it's a little bit further away. Uh, whereas this is a telephoto lens zoomed in on a person, uh, creating more of a in proportion look. Movement is another concept where you can um, take a picture that emphasizes movement through the use of the shutter speed. So you're either freezing action or showing movement with a blur. Or you can create a composition where somebody's eyes move around in the picture based on seeing different things and our eyes bouncing around. So here's an example of the shutter being used to create movement. And this is a slow shutter speed. Uh, and then on this side, we're using the composition to have our eyes move around in the frame. It's possible to have both going on, like in this image, a fast shutter speed froze the action, but our eyes could certainly move around the different elements uh, within the picture. Whereas this image here, not really any movement going on except for the composition movement. Variety has to deal with the amount of difference that we can create in a picture. So the more difference you have, the more variety you're showing. So you want to pack that image full of different things to really show variety. Here's some examples of variety being used with color and shape and form. Unity has to make uh, do with making things as much alike as you can. The more alike they are, the more the same they are, the more you're creating unity. Um, there's some simplicity in it. Uh, 
the closer you have things together, the more unified they can feel. Here's some examples of unity being used. And here's the big one. Emphasis, I feel, is one of the most important principles of design when you're taking a picture. Because generally you want to have a purpose behind the photo and have somebody notice that focal point. So that main element, that main thing that you want to have them notice. And emphasis has to do with making one thing stand out and be noticed first. So having that one thing and really making that one thing pop, having it show up and be noticed first is one of your goals in general when you're taking pictures. So there's four ways that you can create emphasis. There's contrast, location, isolation, and convergence. And we'll talk about all three of those. Contrast is making something different than others within an image. And it could be by having a different color or value or a different size uh, within the image. But you're trying to make it so that one thing is just really different. And because it's different, it will be noticed first. Like in this image, the white umbrella is something that I noticed first because of how bright it is compared to the rest of the image. Location has to do with using the frame of the camera in an interesting way. So when we're looking through the viewfinder, if we line up that main thing that we want to have be noticed to be right in the center of the frame, that's going to naturally draw somebody's attention because our eyes usually go to the center of things when we're looking at something. It's just a natural thing that happens with the way that our eyes work, is they just draw to the center. So if you can put something in the center of the frame, you're probably going to be using emphasis location and that thing will stand out and be noticed first. Emphasis isolation is making one thing stand out from the rest of the composition because it's held within an area of the photo that's not really being used by anything else. So it's isolated because it's separate. So here we've got the bike uh, and the person riding the bike separate from the rest of the composition by this dominant line right here and the amount of space taken up by this dark area versus the light area. It really isolates that person in. Convergence is all about pointing attention somewhere in an image. It's very, very similar to something called leading line, which is a rule of composition that you'll be learning about in our next learning target. But if you can point attention somewhere, kind of like this arrow is pointing attention to where I want you to look, uh, that it would be using convergence. So you have things that point with lines usually to direct attention towards the main area of focus. So these are the different principles of design and their subsets that I want you to know and try to use more in your pictures when you're taking them.